Good afternoon. My name is Shannon King, Associate Professor of History and Director of Black Studies. Thank you for thank you for coming to the Black Studies programs and the Black Lives Matters course event. This woman's work, a conversation about racial inequities and maternal child health and inclusive reproductive justice. Reproductive justice is such an important topic as we watch reproductive and women's rights be debated at this court's highest court. And of course, it is important to the movement for Black lives as we witness the struggles of Black working class women, as well as world class elite athletes like Serena Williams address how reproductive inequities have impacted their lives. Since this is since this is our final event for this spring, I wanted to thank all of our past sponsors and welcome a new one. Now to introduce you to Dean Meredith Kayser, who will introduce the speakers. Great, thank you, Shannon, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Meredith Wallace Kayser, Dean of the Miriam Peckham Egan School of Nursing and Health Studies at Fairfield University. And on behalf of our entire faculty, staff, and administration, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this woman's work a conversation about racial inequities and maternal child health and inclusive reproductive justice, an interdisciplinary program between the Black Studies Program, the Egan School of Nursing and Health Studies, and Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. Those of you who know me may know uh, that I'm a little bit of a storyteller. In my years as a creative writer, I've learned that stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. As I've immersed myself in a community of writers, I've come to realize how strong the impact the beginning has on the end. What happens first bears greatly on what, upon what happens last and everything in between. Mm -hmm. From a current contextual perspective, what happens during the first moments of life from conception to birth shapes everything that follows. From a historical perspective, the racial injustice that has been inflicted upon women throughout history impacts our current societal context. Today, we've taken an interdisciplinary and important step in discussing and promoting a just, equitable, and inclusive start to life so that what happens first has the best possible impact on what happens next and what happens last. The actions we take, the words we say, the hope we bring makes all the difference. It's no surprise to anyone here that our health system falls far short of the basic standards for equitable access and distribution of services. However, care by knowledgeable and experienced providers like those gathered today can and will have a substantial impact on the experience of individuals and families who are privileged to serve. As you know, an event like this takes a village and I'd like to acknowledge the hard work that went into coordinating today's program. To our colleagues in the Black Studies Program and Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies, we thank you for your hard work in coordinating and managing this event. We are deeply indebted to our colleague in care, Autumn Cloud Ingram, a doula, licensed clinical social worker, certified in evidence-based childbirth and parent educator, and founder of Parent Technique, LLC. Ms. Cloud Ingram joins Egan's own Dr. Tanika Eves, an assistant professor and licensed clinical social worker who holds the Connecticut Association for Infant Mental Health Endorsement as an infant mental health specialist. We are grateful to you both for your work in developing and coordinating this program and for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. And thank you all for joining us and your commitment to this important work. It is only through collaborations like this that we have the power to correct course today, tomorrow, and in the years to come. And now just a little housekeeping uh, tab uh, technique here is that Shannon will be managing the Q&A so you can use the chat function and um, we'll, we'll work it from there. So thank you and I wish you a great program. Tanika? Thank you so much, Dean Kayser, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm so glad that you can all join us this afternoon for what I hope will be um, an informative and engaging, um, and I think important conversation. Um, I just wanna extend my thanks again to Dr. King in the Black Studies Department and um, Dean Kayser at Egan School of Nursing and Health Studies and um, Dr. Johanna Garvey in Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies. Um, I, you know, I think Dr. King and I maybe had a conversation early in the fall semester about coming together to, to do this and thinking about where are the intersects you know, in this conversation and then thinking about the Black Lives Matter course and, and how students are um, engaging in, in their studies um, uh, of the Black experience. And so I'm just really happy to be here and so happy to have Autumn join us. Um, and I thought maybe before we kind of get into our conversation, I just wanted Autumn to have a few minutes um, to tell us a little bit about who she is and maybe what brought you to this work. 
Absolutely. So hello, everyone. Um, I am so excited to be here. I've been thinking about this for several weeks um, and I'm just excited at any opportunity to talk about and be with other people um, who are interested in this topic. So I birth work has been something that I feel like really chose me. And from the time I was really young, I just had an interest in, um, when I was 18, I did my first, uh, training as a doula. And then I learned about, um, uh, full spectrum uh, doula care. Um, and then I really got into um, childbirth education and the importance of that. And then I got into um, postpartum doula work, um, all while um, working in the capacity as a clinician in, in different programs, working for home-based programs, working for hospital programs, um, where I was also doing similar work and, and helping families in the transition from um, uh, you know, the in early postpartum days throughout, um, throughout parenthood. And so, uh, I started about three years ago, a uh, parent technique, which, um, provides a combination of like really comprehensive childbirth education, perinatal therapy, um, for parents that are, um, uh, needing some support in that transition to um, to parenthood, because as a clinician, what I was seeing, and even in my work um, in various capacities as a as a birth worker, was that there was such a tremendous lack of care, and the service that did exist was really crisis oriented. There really wasn't a whole lot uh, of work on the preventative side, and um, that uh, you know I knew was was really my my calling. And so um, that's what brings me here today. Um, and uh, I'm excited to just yeah have conversation and um, and answer questions. Great, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I, so I think what we agreed to do is a little, a little polling, a little quiz. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you will have the option in your Zoom. I'm going to launch a poll to get a sense of, you know, how much do people know about some of these topics and issues. So there's going to be four questions. Um, if we were pers in person, I'd have candy and prizes for people who got things right, <laughs> but we'll have to do that another time. So I'm going to launch the poll and then we'll see what we get. So there's four questions. What year did the largest mass sterilization take place in America? Two is what is the current mortality, maternal mortality rate for black women compared to white women? Mm -hmm. I think three asks um, who were um, the mothers of gynecology? And then the fourth one, Autumn, can you remind me of the fourth question? Uh, oh, um, what is the, uh, I'm sorry, that had to do with um, maternal, um, like rate of uh, maternal complications oh. for black women. So I, right, or maternal maternal, pain perception. Right? It was a study about oh, pain perception, racial difference. That's right, that's right. I'm gonna, I'm sorry, thank you. So I'm gonna, I'm going <laughs> to launch the poll and hopefully, I press launch. Now we'll see what happens. So it looks like a lot of people. So I think we're done. So it looks like about most of the audience picked night the 1930s mm -hmm. as the answer. So what year did the largest mass sterilization take place in the 1930s? What is the current maternal mortality rate for Black women compared to white women? Uh, 67% chose four times, 32% okay. chose two times. Okay. So question number three, in a randomized control trial, what percent of medical students and residents endorsed false beliefs about biological difference for black patients, such as their skin being thicker and their nerve ending being less sensitive compared to white patients? So 67% um, picked 36% of medical students. Um, and 33% picked 50%. Who are the mothers of gynecology? Oh, so oh, you guys are smart, a lot of people. So 33% um, picked Jane Adams, Molly Pitcher, and Elizabeth Blackwell. And then 67% chose Lucy, Betsy, and Anarka. Okay, so I guess, Autumn, would you like to enlighten us to what the right answers were? <laughs> Absolutely. So the first one, and we'll, as we go through, and Tanika, we talk and um, you'll see where the answers to those will come will come up. Um, 
Oh, great. Thank you for sharing that with me. Oh, thank so you. I can see it now. Um, so yeah. So for number one, what year did the largest, what was the largest um, mass sterilization that was actually um, in the 1970s, between the 1970s to the 1980s. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but this was um, hysterectomies that were done really without consent um, by women, predominantly um, black women and poor women that received Medicaid. Uh, for number two, what is the current maternal mortality rate for black women compared to white women um, in America? And the answer is four times. So a little more than half of you got that correct. So four times. Number three, in a randomized control trial, what percent of medical students and residents endorse false beliefs about biological differences for black patients, such as having thicker skin, their nerve endings being less sensitive compared to white patients? Um, <clears throat> that answer is 50%. So 50% in an RCT or randomized control trial, uh, a medical students and residents uh, endorse those false beliefs. And number four, who are the mothers of gynecology? And we'll, I will, we'll talk more about that. Uh, the answer there is uh, Lucy, Betsy, and Anarka. Okay, so I'm, I, I'm wondering how many people surprise themselves with how much they knew or how little they knew, or but maybe when we get to Q&A, we can talk about that more. Um, sure. So I wonder as we begin our conversation, um, if you might give us some historical context that helps us situate Black maternal infant uh, health and how that has evolved over time in, in American US society. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's essential, especially focus, when we're focusing on maternal health, in particular Black maternal health in America, that we have to look at the beginning, right? We have to look at the very beginning of the experience of Black women and Black pregnant women in America, um, which also tragically means that we have to talk about slavery and that a lot of this um, started with slavery. Um, and so not only did you have um, enslaved people, right, that, that were brought over to America, which was horrific, um, but those, those uh, women were also very much coerced and forced um, to childbear. And what that means is that they were forced to also participate in the very thing that kept them enslaved because that, you know, as, as many of us know, slaves were, were property and brought money, right? To, to the people that owned them. And uh, so the more slaves that there were owned by white slave masters, the more money that they made. So childbearing was uh, very much, very much um, one of the, the, the biggest uh, aspects of slavery that, that continued it, that perpetuated itself. Um, and so that's a really heavy, that's a really deep and as, as, as though I know that and think about that often, um, that's an aspect that is just, it's a, that's a lot to take in that they were also forced to do the very thing um, that kept them enslaved. Um, and that that brought, you know, the slaves money. Um, and, and the other thing, important aspect, I think when, when we're talking about um, reproductive justice, right, and autonomy, and like, what are the, what are the fears when we, when we fear that that's going to be violated, right? We think of things such as, right, coercion. We think of things such as the separate, this fear of the separation between like uh, the mother's well-being, right, and the baby's well-being. And then the other thing is like really just viewing uh, women in their bodies as a way to reproduce, right? Um, and those are all aspects that have come into play even recently, right? Those thoughts that, that can undermine reproductive justice. Um, and while women at different, all women, right? At different facets of time have experienced that, um, black women and enslaved women experienced all three of those things and have for endured for the longest period since the beginning. And so when we look at things like the statistics now of black women, you know, facing complications and being four times more likely to die, we can't fully understand that and why that is without looking at that, that very beginning. Um, 
the other component of one of the questions, the last questions talked about like, who are the mothers of gynecology? Um, so I can't uh, talk about them without also talking about this um, uh, OBGYN at the time, whose name was uh, James Marion Sims, who um, is well known for inventing um, the speculum which is a tool, um, you know, if you're a person with a uterus at some point, <laughs> uh, right, you might have had a well visit that um, included a speculum, and so that is uh, accredited to him. Um, but he also, uh, between like 1830s, 1840s, operated on enslaved Black women. So this was women that were, um, you know, did not, were not able to consent, and also weren't given any kind of pain medicine at all, because the belief then was that they didn't need it. And again, going back to that first quiz question, right, looking at the beginning thought belief, we still have a long way to go, because clearly, right, 50% of residents and medical students still endorse some kind of belief related to the fact that they feel Black people experience less pain. So, as I'm listening to you, and so I actually, I was very intrigued by the story of Anarka, Betsy, and Lucy, so I had gone back to do some reading about that, and I think they are primary examples of, of sort of during that time, when we think about how we think about pregnancy in modern day times in terms of you need to have proper prenatal care and you should be getting follow-up and the kinds of nutrition and rest versus activity that is necessary. Um, one of the things that struck me in reading the narrative was that they were 17 and 18 years old. So when we think of them, you know, in the historical texts as mothers of gynecology or women, they were 17 and 18 years old and had already had at least one birth. Um, I guess the infant mental health person in me wonders, were they able to be involved in their children's lives? Were they able to mother them? What, you know, what, what were those circumstances and, and what, what they 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 all had complicated pregnancies, which was why Dr. Sims was operating on them um, without consent, without pain medication. And it just, you know, I can only sort of, I mean, I guess I can't imagine the the conditions that they were pregnant under um, and how that may contribute, you know, when you think about the intrauterine environment and epigenetics and how we're learning how environment interacts with genes and can be passed on across generations then it starts to make sense to me, you know, why we're in the situation that we're in now. Mm, um, yeah. But I also wondered how, how did this context intersect with this idea of sort of parental authority or your child belonging to you mm. and, and maternal infant health and mental health perspective? That is an excellent, yeah, that's an excellent and also um, weighty question. And the fact is, um, Again, going back to the beginning, there was no parental autonomy. They didn't own, they weren't people, right? So they weren't, black women weren't people, black men weren't people. Um, their children were completely ruled by, not them, right? By, by, by a family. They did not have um, ability to uh, educate them in the way they want to be educated. They didn't have naming rights, right? You were named after... Um, the masters. I mean, there was no, there was no autonomy. And when we, when we think about, and maybe if everyone who's listening, just take a moment and think about what, when you think about parenthood, what is that? Like if, if someone asked you, define like, what is the core component of being a parent in parenthood? Just take a moment and think about what that is. For me, and, and uh, you know, I, I think uh, to an extent, a lot of people, the things that come up are care, right? And autonomy to be able to, to make choices um, for your child. And the bottom line is that um, that didn't happen, you know? Um, <laughs> enslaved women at that time were forced to literally feed um, their master's children. They didn't even get to feed their own children. They didn't get to clothe their own children. Um, all of that was was taken away from them and and that's that's heavy right and so thinking almost if you think a little bit linearly too for a second we have slavery which really started in the 1600s right to about 1860 the ending and then we had um 
segregation, right? We had sundown towns, we had Jim Crow laws, we had, there was, right? And so that went on, I don't know, 80 years, right? Um, until about, right, until we had like the Civil Rights Act. And so all of that time was not time that you could care for, right? And make autonomous decisions for your child if you are a black person. And still today, we see the impacts of those things still being in play. So even if we look at that question, how long have black folks in America been able to parent? That answer is like, maybe 120 years, right? Like maybe 120 years, if you count that time when we still had laws, right? Like it segregation laws. So that's a really heavy thing to think about. Like, what does it mean to parent? And, and how much has that been impacted for black families as opposed to white families? And the truth is, if we were to draw that timeline, you know, of being enslaved, of segregation laws, you know, that timeline looks like maybe a hundred years. Yeah, I think we, we, we talked about this a little. I, I think we were saying 60 or 70 years because yeah. even pre, so I mean, I, probably depending on what part of the country you lived in, mm -hmm. you know, the level of, of parental authority probably looked very different um, right. before there was legislation um, to, to protect the civil rights of, of, of all citizens, right? Like, so yeah, I, I, I maybe 60 to 100 years, which is not, that's not a very long time. And I, I also, I know from, from, from my perspective as a clinician, um, when you're in survival mode, it's very difficult uh, to parent effectively. It's difficult to bond or attach with your child. It's difficult to hear or see your child as a separate individual with their own needs and desires and wishes. That that's very difficult when you're just trying to survive, um, or if and if you are living in fear. Um, so so I I I think that makes sense that 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 this. The parental autonomy is probably a relatively new concept um, for, for African descendant people in, in this country. It really, it really is. It really is. And we still see where if we ask the question, which is a big one, right? Like what is autonomy and choice? Still how limited those options are. Even when we think about something like, right? It's we're a university, right? So just keeping it to education, how impacted, um, Black families have been, right? And, and how much choice has still been limited due to um, those hundreds and hundreds of years of, of enslavement, of segregation, et cetera. So I want to shift the, the conversation a little bit when we think about choice mm -hmm. and, and sort of uh, how Dr. King began this introducing this conversation. We, we are having, there's a lot going on in terms of women and choice. And, and what's being argued and brought to the highest court in the land. Um, yeah. And so when I think about going back maybe 50 years to, to the reproductive rights movement, that was mm -hmm. all about choice. Yeah. But it was largely choice not to have children. And so now uh, what we're talking about is in terms of parental autonomy and, and being denied the right to have and parent and raise your children, you know, under under the conditions that you set. Um, in what ways does the reproductive rights movement sort of maybe miss mm. miss some things in terms of how Black and Indigenous and women of color that you know can it be assumed that all women have the same concerns when it comes to reproductive rights and choice? Does it look the same for all of us? No. <laughs> And, and this is great because something that I think at least at the university level is happening a little bit more, but still hasn't happened a lot is um, not recognizing that the women's rights movement was not originally built and designed for black women. It wasn't, it, it wasn't. Um, and so, so when we look at the impacts of reproductive justice in Black women in the time of the women's rights movement, we also have uh, eugenics happening around that time, okay? And so 
Um, some of you might be familiar, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Planned Parenthood. And um, Margaret Sanger was the founder of what later became Planned Parenthood and, and had other names before that. Um, and at first really was trying to advocate for um, birth control, was a huge proponent of, of birth control within the women's rights movement. And at that time, uh, that movement was a very conservative movement. So they kind of, Margaret kind of like got the boot. And what happened was um, there was able to be an appealing to unfortunately the eugenics movement. And so the eugenics movement was um, really focused on the fact or the belief that um, that uh, the challenges that black people say that um, you know faced poverty, being less intelligent, all of that were biological. So we know that those are those are social determinants, right? That 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 happen um, because of systemic social issues. But eugenics believed that like inherently black people had biological differences that made them um, more fertile, less intelligent, um, less likely to experience pain, etc. And um, so the, the birth control movement there ended up um, really becoming part of the eugenics movement. And so that's where you get into um, a bit of the history of um, coerced sterilizations, right? Or um, com com no consent at all, um, uh, you know, sterilizations of women. So, so when that women's rights and reproductive justice movement started, that was really more about this, um, uh, what the ideal of what it meant to be a mother at that point, which did not look like or encompass black women and their strengths or their challenges. Um, and in fact, led to um, this other uh, hor horrifying you know, issue, which was when, when became this, you know, forced sterilizations um, of black women. And, from the beginning, and as we talk more about present, you'll notice that there's this constant, what I and Tanika, I know we've talked about this before, this push and pull, right? This push of like, you need to ha yeah, have children because that benefits me and makes me money, right? To now, uh, we are you have no rights, you don't deserve at all to be able to have or be able to care for your children. So now we're gonna, so it's, it constantly goes back between this push and pull. Um, but yeah, absolutely, the, the women's rights movement and the, the birth control and reproductive rights movement at its start, um, was not designed with black folks in it, <laughs> which is a problem. And, and of course then did not um, have them in mind um, and was really thought of as a way to, to, um, to manage reproduction um, as opposed to really give autonomy to, to black women and families. So you're taking me into sort of where my next question was gonna go. If we're thinking about the beginning, we start at the beginning. Yeah. And, and you, you've already mentioned um, the forced sterilization. I, I think sometimes, I mean, I've read cases of sterilization where women did not know they were being sterilized. They, yes. they were consent, but they also didn't know that that was the surgery they were having. I know in modern current literature, um, I think black and Latina women are more likely to be um, recommended for hysterectomies, um, which is the removal of the uterus and ovaries. And, and in many incidences where maybe that isn't necessary there might be more uh, you know less invasive um alternative treatments for you know whatever is ailing them yeah. um so it, it's just interesting to see these connections but you you mentioned um at a certain point in history hmm. african descendant women and their birthing was a commodity it was a market profit commodity right and they were forced to bear children for profit i think particularly after um the transatlantic slave trade was was illegal. Then it was we need to reproduce what we have here, right? Um, and so, how I mean, how have those views? And you mentioned you touched on a little bit, but like a, a fertility changed. So you mentioned the sterilizations in the seventies, and I know another thing that was happening in the seventies was a lot of controversy and vitriol around social welfare and public welfare. So I wonder if you could talk about how those things are connected. Yes, so what happened, there's there's a strong connection. So, so how did this like, uh, how did this happen, right? How did these, how, what was the process for these sterilizations in, in so many of them, hundreds of them, hundreds of thousands of them to happen um, was 
oftentimes to be able to receive this assistance, which was needed because again, black people were shut out of education, out of jobs, right? Out of all the things that would help somebody housing. Uh, have enough money, housing, exactly. Redlining, all these things, right? Shut out of all of those policies legally, right? That was the law. Um, so then of course, right, we need public assistance to live. And then um, oftentimes those programs were the programs that would um, coerce. So there's a lot of examples of, of women and even today, feeling really hassled and pressured. I've worked in hospitals, I've worked in programs, and there is, they'll be like, so-and-so came in, or five doctors came in, or pressuring me to give them an answer on birth control, or pressuring me, exactly, right, to like have, have a hysterectomy. Um, and uh, so those were often used as, as ways, either to like, you, you need to get this, right, like you need to, uh, 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 you know, take a nor plant, which is like a longer lasting um, birth control pill in order to qualify for this form of public assistance, um, those measures, or sometimes uh, financial incentives, right? And so again, we think about choice. If someone is in poverty and has been legally pushed out of all the, the things that they could do to better themselves, um, that's right. That's a huge. That's a huge ethical um, issue. But it was done. Um, it was done. There would be five hundred, a thousand dollars if you, you know, get the nor plant implement. You know, um, taken today if you take the pill. Um, and so uh, that's what happened. And then there are plenty of uh, women too that would go in for uh, maybe more of a minor procedure or surgery, and then they would have a hysterectomy, and they wouldn't know. Like it, they wouldn't have been told, or they would have tried to later. Um, have tried to get pregnant and, and couldn't. And, um, and so this skyrocketed in between the 70s and 80s, I mean, up to like 700 in the United States, like 700,000 women without their consent um, that were all women or about 50% of the women, um, I'm sorry, were Medicaid, were, um, were Medicaid patients. I think about this from a clinical perspective because so many of the young women I've worked with as a clinician um, you know, 50 years ago would have been those women or, and, and, and even today, um, have, have, are, are strongly encouraged. So now we have, um, IUDs that, I mean, that those are not new, but now they're, they're developed an IUD. So that's an intrauterine device that can, it used to be that you have to have had at least one child before having that. Now they're, it's, they're designing it so that you don't ever have had to give birth. But for so many of the moms that I work with, um, when they get to that six week visit after having the baby, and these are young teenage moms who often don't have a lot of resources, it's let's put this IUD in. And, you know, there's not, there's the one, and I was always conflicted about that because one part of me feels like, well, another baby would complicate, children are expensive, children right. can, can complicate our lives. But who's, who's has the right? Whose right is it to make those decisions? And then we're asking women to put things in their bodies that, you know, we don't know how they affect every individual woman. There's been a lot of complications and controversy with different methods of birth control, particularly the longer acting methods. And so that's another, you know, where's the concern for potential health hazards and what does that look like? And, um, I think it's very, very complex. And I find myself struggling with that um, on a personal level, but as well as a clinician too, like, you know, who, who should be able to say, and, and, sh and should that be something they, sh they should, sh should they be pressured to have to make those kinds of decisions if they're not really sure, if they don't know enough about the side effects or if they just don't want it, if they just yeah. don't want it in their body. Right. Um, so uh, yeah, it's really, really complicated. You you bring up an excellent point about informed consent, which is something that, again, in our country, uh, for any, you know, uh, you know, uh, birthing or, or pregnant person is really poor. I mean, we, it, it's, um, and especially for, uh, for Black women, for Hispanic women, um, that there really is very it is seldom, seldom, seldom that their options, right, or the benefits and risks of anything are explained. It's just assumed. Um, and, and that kind of, it, it's assumed that it needs to be managed, right? That like this person is not capable. And so I need to tell them, I know it's best. So this is very like paternalistic um, view. 
and and uh, and that is a, it happens even more so with um, uh, with again with with women of color that it's that we still don't really based on those stats um, see them as individual people that are capable of making their own decisions and that it, we really need to look at uh, because what we're saying is again that they're not fit to make these decisions. They're not fit, right, to parent. They're not fit to make a decision about, you know, what is to go into their body. Um, and that's highly, highly, highly problematic. And again, is not far from the thinking, right, that happened going back to the beginning. Right. It, right? It, thinking about it, slavery. It's really the same thought. It's the same thought process. With more technology. Yeah. So it's right. So it isn't just the parental autonomy. It's it's the bodily autonomy and agency, yes. which which has always been um, tenuous and fragile in in this context, right? Yeah. So yes. Like, Majorly. Yeah. So Majorly. It's like we're seeing different iterations of it, and maybe, yeah. Like now, now you're making me think maybe, maybe it's not so terribly different from 150 or 170 years ago. Um, yeah. So I so so given this complex historical and sociopolitical context that we're discussing in terms of how U.S. society has has treated black birthing bodies and, and childbearing bodies, um, how does that connect to what we are currently seeing in terms of the state of affairs where in 2022 um, black women have uh, they're four times uh, more likely to die in childbirth. I think black infants are two to three times more likely to die. Um, what's the, what, what's the connection? Yeah. How, right. How does that connect? The connection is, is I, that part of it speaks to, we are not as far along as we think that we are in terms of the treatment, in terms of how we view and don't view, um, black people and their bodies and options of pain still being what they are, right? And not listening. Um, the, you know, the CDC says that most of these deaths are preventable. The, the, that Black women die four times the rate than white women done, most of those are preventable. And preventable um, often because there are signs and symptoms that are dismissed. That is, the, that is like the number one reason. And so, um, why are they dismissed more than white folks? Because there are still these well-meaning, great people, right? That providers that probably have people of color in their family, know people of color, but there is still um, often this, this the unconscious bias, right? I think running. Um, and when we talk about the history of medicine and specifically OBGYNs, you know, J. Marion Sims is the, is the, you know, known as the, the father of gynecology. That's the history. And so as much as there might be some other trainings and, and we think that we move away from um, those thought processes, a lot of them have not changed. A lot of, you know, one of the things I talk a lot about with families that I work with is what's called the, um, the evidence-based practice gap. Okay. So this means from what is the what is the gap between when we have current evidence based on uh, you know what the current evidence is saying on an intervention related to birth compared to when it becomes routine practice mm -hmm. okay and that gap is 15 to 20 years wow 15 to 20 years so so yeah. like for my age right what evidence shows now or even has shown right but it's just being acknowledged now will not be routine practice until my daughter is old enough to have a child that's what that means. Okay. And so, and so that's now let's imagine being a person of color, right. And, and what that experience is that that gap in care becoming routine for them is going to be even wider. That's remarkable. Yeah. I, I don't think yeah. I, and I, I know things. So I once had a, a supervisor early in my career who said to me, and we were working a policy, um, people will be having the same conversations for 15 or 20 years before this is, gets implemented. And this is that's what you're reminding me of. That I, and I don't think I've yeah. realized how long it takes for an evidence-based uh, practice to become standard of care, and which, which yeah. also, I, so I do feel like I would be a little bit remiss if I didn't mention um, in terms of from an intersectional perspective, birth in the United States in general 
is not great for any woman. So yeah. the United <laughs> States is considered one of the most dangerous places to give birth. I think we have either the highest or second highest maternal infant mortality rate. The in, highest, oh, the highest of all developed nations. Number one, we're the best. So in the industrialized world, so it's bad for everybody. Right. Um, and and I, you, you mentioned sort of, um, and this is not to um, uh, denigrate OBGYNs, but, but that there is a lot of over-medicalization of the birthing process. And yes. so, so you're talking about um, with many black women where maybe signs and symptoms were sort of disregarded, but then you also have this over intervention that goes on that, that in some ways suggests that women don't know their bodies, that women, without, that women don't know how to give birth. Yes. Which is, which is really remarkable and, and, and very particular to our country and culture. This isn't happening in other parts of the world. Um, yes. And as Most, a doula, you yeah. probably have things to say about that. <laughs> it, I do. It's very true. It's very true. Um, so this, like, why? So, so in most of the world, midwives attend, midwives are the standard. America is like the only nation where we have surgeons, which are amazing, and we need them because there are also so many women and babies that are living. So I need to say that, that, that are living healthy lives because of interventions in science and, and medicine. Um, and that's really, really critical and really, really important. What the issue becomes, right? And um, anyone on that's, that, you know, a medical provider knows that every single thing that is done has some sort of benefit and has some sort of risk. Okay. And so what we see in America happening is that, um, and again, disproportionately negatively impacting black women, though across the board, it's, it's, it's bad for women is that um, a lot of these interventions carry risks and they're used when that birthing person is already low risk. So what we are tending to do most of the time in America, right? Like about 50% of births um, are induced, right? And there are absolutely times that you need to have an induction, right? If you have preeclampsia, right? Or severe hypertension, the benefits of you being induced far outweigh, <laughs> right? The, the risks of not. And so, um, so there are those times, but what happens here is that we often implement interventions that are not medically necessary and we do them and convenience out of the patient's end, not knowing, you know? And so that's where we have the over-medicalization is interventions that all carry their own set of risks, right? But we're using them with, low risk folks, birthing folks that don't need it. So what we're really doing is just adding risk and introducing risk to a situation into a pregnancy that doesn't need it. And that's where, uh, that's where, you know, enter the, the statistics, right? That like where we have like the poorest um, maternal mortality rates, um, you know, compared to all other developed nations. Um, and so we have to really work on, you know, striking that balance and um, midwives for low risk uh, birthing folks are it. They're huge. I mean, the statistics are huge. That's really the best. So I, I got, I, I'll get into mentioning what are like three practical things, right? That you could leave here today or tell a friend, right? That's pregnant or talk with your friend. That's a, I don't know, a nurse or a doctor about. And one of those things is midwives. Okay. So we know that for low risk birthing folks, the, the care received by midwives is, is the outcomes are better. There's um, significantly increased um, chance of having a spontaneous vaginal birth their uh, birth satisfaction is higher. Um, with midwives, you have uh, any decrease in perennial trauma, uh, decrease in neonatal death, um, decrease in epidural rates. And so if you are a low risk person, um, midwifery care really needs to become the norm there. Um, and if you are high risk, then absolutely, right? That's when we need um, OBGYNs, right? Um, the other is doulas. Right. And so I'm, I'm a doula. Some of you, there's a whole wide range of doulas, but here I'm specifically talking about birth doulas. So birth doulas decrease C-section rate by like 25 to 30%. That's huge. 
C-sections are awesome. C-sections save lives, but they're also tremendously overused and they also carry a lot of risks. And so we only need, we need to make sure that we're doing them when they're medically necessary. And right now we are doing them when they're not medically necessary, meaning we're doing them when we're really just putting birthing folks at risk. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know. Um, and the other aspect of um, increasing, uh, again, vaginal, spontaneous vaginal births with doulas. So midwives, doulas. And the last thing is really, truly comprehensive childbirth education. And um, so when I say comprehensive, I'm referring to childbirth, not like a one day, three hour hospital class, because those classes tend to just cover um, what to expect, right? Like upon admittance to the hospital and maybe they talk about epidurals. Comprehensive childbirth ed covers a whole range of comfort measures and has you practice them and really talks about what it means to get and how to obtain evidence-based care, okay? And that form of childbirth education is huge because again, um, it decreases the need for newborn resuscitation. Um, it decreases the second stage of labor, right? The pushing stage by about a half hour, which if you're listening and, <laughs> and you've given birth before, no, is a very large amount of time. 30 minutes is like a huge amount of time. Um, right. So that's huge. So decreases the second stage of labor. Um, so those are the three really concrete things that um, I really like to share and spread the word on because they can, you, you know, again, you can share them um, and talk about their benefits and, um, and help, right, to get midwifery care, doula care, and comprehensive childbirth ed, um, things that become a part of uh, the default, right, and, and default because we know that they're preventative, right, Absolutely. particularly for Black women, for all women. All, Right. Every birthing person is going to only benefit from this. Um, but and again, that that goes to thinking about when we um, like equity. Right. And when we center marginalized folks. Right. And in this aspect, we're talking about black women. Um, that's not dismissing all other women. Right. It's still right. only right when we go and focus on the marginalized group, everybody benefits. Right. Right. So this is, so I, I just want to quickly add for anyone who's on this webinar who has given birth or have been in labor or will be, every second counts. <laughs> labor. So yes. those are great statistics. <laughs> um, but so now you're leading me to, so in terms of this access to evidence-based um, childbirth education yeah. and, and where the equity is with that, um, I, I'm kind of wanting to, to talk with you a little bit about sort of what, what has been the activism, like what's been the response to the state of affairs? So we, we, we touched on reproductive justice a little bit, but I'm not sure that we underscored that the reproductive justice movement was sort of an answer to the reproductive rights movement to say, this needs to be more inclusive and more comprehensive. And it isn't just about the right to access to birth control or abortion, it's also about the right to a healthy birth and to have and raise and parent my own child. So I wonder if you could talk. Yes, yes. And, and I think this is perfect because we're actually entering Black Maternal Health Week starting April 11th. So this timing of the like April is like just the best month for a lot of reasons. Also, I love spring. Um, but, but Black Maternal Health Week. So be on the lookout if you're on social media. Um, so I, I will start with then talking about the Black Mamas Matter Alliance. So I'm going to talk about different agencies predominantly run by Black women um, because they know their needs best. <laughs> um, so the Black Mamas Matter Alliance has been providing training on the state of maternal care for Black women, on uh, supporting Black women doing the work, supporting Black uh, childbirth educators, doulas, um, nurses, getting uh, grants to be able to support them. So um, please check out the Black Mamas Matter Alliance. There's going to be a handout, Tanika, too, that we give that will have this information for everyone. Um, but so they have been around for, oh, I don't remember that exception, but, but several years. Um, and their role has really been in doing a lot of advocacy, a lot, a lot of advocacy. Um, I also want to talk about the Black uh, Maternal Health Caucus, right, which recently passed what's known as the, the Momnibus Bill um, in Congress. So this is super comprehensive. This, this just happened in, I think it was October, um, just 
this past October, um, which provides a Black Maternal Mortality Review Board, um, which is covering and giving grants and funding um, to Black maternal health care providers. This was really, really huge. Um, so this caucus has been and now is going to have a lot of work, which is a great thing to do um, as that just passed. So if you type in, you know, Black Maternal Health Caucus, you can check them out. For any um, uh, person that's listening or if you know, right, um, a person of color that's that's um, pregnant or going to be, you know, giving birth soon, I also want to highlight um Kimberly Seals. So she founded what's called the Earth, I-R-T-H app, which is the first and only app of this kind um, that is specifically for Black and Brown birthing folks and care providers to rate the care in a hospital, right? So if you are a Black or Brown birthing person or provider, you can go to this app and literally it asks different questions about what was the care you received, how responsive were care providers to you. Um, I have gone in myself and entered uh, the like the hospitals that I've been in as a doula for other people. And then I went in and talked about where I delivered in the birthing center that I delivered at, you know, and um, and went in and rated that. So right now, and this is another huge thing, hospitals do not are not obligated to report their statistics on on breastfeeding, on you know, cesarean rates. They can voluntarily. You can go to, um, if you go to leapfrog.com, you can check out the hospitals that, that post their statistics, but they're not required to. And often, right, like you're going to want to post your statistics if they're good and you're not going to want to post them if, <laughs> if they're not so good. Mm -hmm. um, and so this app is really huge because, again, looking at that disproportionate Black women being four times more likely to to have a complication or die as a result of childbirth, um, lets them go in and look at, wow, what is the actual care that other people that look like me, right, and half my background are receiving? Um, because we can't rely on hospital statistics, unfortunately. And I hope at some point that that kind of law can be changed and that it is mandated that <laughs> we post. But in the meantime, they're not. So this app is really, really huge, Earth app. Very easy to use. You just gave a whole bunch of awesome resources. So I'm, I'm just curious if hospitals do not have to report out statistics. I mean, do you have a sense of what sort of accountability measures are in place, if, that, if that's internal, in terms of how are they recording how well births go? So I, I worked for a community, a, quali a federally qualified community health center okay. where we had, there was a midwifery practice who birthed all of our young mothers. And um, they had, I mean, I don't know if they reported them out, but they knew that their attended births, mothers were less likely to have C-sections. They labored for um, shorter periods of time. They were more likely to breastfeed. They were less likely to have tearing. And they, you know, they really documented and charted and paid attention to what do these outcomes look like? And, and this was a community that was mostly, you know, black and brown women. So, I mean, what does accountability look like then? It's not good. Uh, to be to be frank, it's it's not good. I will also want to talk about um, oh my goodness, birth monopoly. And I apologize because I'm forgetting her name. Uh, oh, Kristen um, Pazlucci. I think I'm pronouncing her last name wrong. But birth monopoly uh, is her is her website, and she does a lot of work um, talking about and fighting for. Um, uh, po policies that need to change in transparency. Um, right now, honestly, there isn't a lot of accountability. Like if you have like a, a poor experience that you want to report, you can bring it to the hospital, but typically there's a review board and they kind of handle it internally and there isn't necessarily a, a lot of recourse. Uh, you could get a lawyer, but we we know again, access <laughs> to okay. that is, is tough and still are very hard cases to win a lot of the times when it comes to birth because it's, um, it, it, there isn't necessarily a measure, right? Or there isn't evidence. If you said, well, so-and-so said this to me or treated me this way or did this thing is really, it's a lot easier to hide behind, well, we needed to do this thing. And that birthing person or partner that's in the room, mm -hmm. right? And so, but, but she has a lot of great information on like, what are some ways you can try to um, get through that process? But honestly, right now, there isn't a whole lot of accountability that's built in to be able to choose, right? And you should be able to say, oh, 
can't pick, right? We should have options available for different kinds of hospitals, different kinds of birthing centers, and there's more support for home births, which are also, we know, evidence-based for low-risk people. Right. Still happen very seldom, but very safe if you're a low-risk person to have a home birth. Um, and so uh, options in, and uh, hospitals and birthing centers and providers being able to share more readily those statistics should be made, mm-hmm. right, really to families. And, and it's unfortunate that at this point in time, you know, those are really, no, those are hard to get, but you can system. check out, yeah, Leapfrog. And if you type in MPINC, so we're in Connecticut, you M-P-I-N-C, uh, Connecticut, that tells you some, you know, information about like rooming in and breastfeeding rates and rates of skin to skin okay. for the state. And if you go to leapfrog.com, um, you can type in any hospital. Mm-hmm. And if they report their statistics, um, then you can get statistics on episiotomy rates, um, uh, cesarean rates, um, let's see, skin to skin, and I'm forgetting the other two, but, but so you can go, and even that can be really interesting, like what hospitals do you see do and don't report, because that in itself can give you a lot of information. Great, so now I wondered if now would be a good time, so, so you're reminding me, um, and I don't know if she's on this webinar, but a colleague of mine who you know, because I think you guest lectured for her class, Dr. Jenna, and I hope I'm gonna say her last name wrong, but um, Lajadichi, I don't know if I'm saying that wrong, but um, she's a colleague here uh, in the nursing at Egan School and as a midwife, and um, she very graciously invited me to participate a few months back in um, a perinatal quality improvement 28 day anti-racism challenge. And it was released through the Institute for Perinatal Quality Improvement. And it was really, it was really incredible. Um, so I, I think th- those kinds of efforts are at play in order to get providers to really be thinking about their implicit bias, to be thinking about issues of access and equity. But I yes. wonder if now would be a good time to share one of the things I forgot what day it was, but I received this really interesting graphic called the maze of life that mm. kind of depicted where do women in society, where, like where do they start? So it was comparing black women to white women in terms of what's the historical context? Where do you start and, and, and how that impacts birth and pregnancy? So right. I'm gonna try to share my screen and hope that everyone will be able to see it. Yeah, sure that. And while you're pulling that up, I wanna say, if you are someone interested, right? In becoming a medical provider, you know, um, or you're just, you know, somebody that's gonna be giving birth or you're maybe thinking about, right? Having a child soon, I highly, highly recommend um, specifically taking to an evidence-based birth childbirth class. So I have said that um, I'm an evidence-based birth instructor and the, the core of EBB was founded by a nurse, a Dr. Rebecca Decker with her PhD, um, who, you know, uh, was a nurse, went through, had her first baby and afterwards questioned a lot of the experiences that she had, right? And a lot of the treatment that she got and began to do research on, huh, what is the evidence for eating and drinking and labor? What is the evidence for being able to have a water birth? And found, in fact, that a lot of the routine or regular care in a hospital was in fact not evidence-based and um, could even um, be detrimental to, to birthing folks. And so she started evidence-based birth. So that is on, um, that will be on the sheet of resources, but I highly recommend going to evidencebasedbirth.com. There is a ton of like one page handouts too that Rebecca has on just the evidence on, uh, you know, different things that come up um, in pregnancy and and the different um, routine care and the evidence on them. Um, And again, if you're interested, highly, highly recommend taking um, the evidence-based birth childbirth class. Thank you. Yes, I can see this, Tanika. Can I, I hope everyone else can see it. Um, so I, I was able to audit one of Autumn's evidence-based childbirth classes, and it really is it's incredibly enlightening. I mean, even, you know, for me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm past giving birth, but um, I just for, for people who I know in my life who are still childbearing and expecting, it was just really helpful to get a sense of, you know, what, what's happening, um, new information, and, and again, um, minimizing the medical interventions as much as possible. Um, so I hope everyone can see this. If you cannot, maybe put a little note in Q and A section. Um, so this this is this was one of the visuals that the Perinatal Quality Improvement um, Institute had shared during their challenge. 
And so I, mean, mm. I think it's a little bit simplistic. I, I, I do not know that it's fair to say that every white person starts with privilege and freedom and you know that, that right. could be debatable, but it's just trying to offer a context of if we're starting with this sort of collective intergenerational post-traumatic stress of 246 years of slavery, um, and then having to navigate Jim Crow racist policies, this idea of the weathering effect, which has to do with um, how, and this is, I don't wanna get too biological, but sort of how does stress impact gene expression? And then how does that interface with people's health? And that um, people who are living in compromised circumstances experience a weathering, um, which, which diminishes their health and well being. So it, this is just a really sort of powerful graphic in terms of like, where do you start when you're pregnant and, 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 and what, you know, what's already sort of working in your favor, perhaps what's working against you. Um, so then we do see, I mean, you know, in the United States, white women are more likely to have better education, better health care, more opportunity, not all, but they are more likely to have that access than black women. Um, so that's just the one graphic um, visual, but I also wanted to yeah. touch on a little bit on them before we get to our wrap up and question and answer session. Um, what you'll hear a lot, I think, in the sort of public pop culture, you know, is um, that this is just about class. And I know we've talked a lot about poverty and equity and access. Yeah. Um, and I know that there have been a couple of um, news coverage where um, this is idea that it used to be that race itself was a risk factor for birth outcomes. Mm. And now that narrative is shifting to, it's not the race of the patient, it's the racism that they encounter. Yes. Um, and so why is this not just about class? Because we've seen very high profile, wealthy, powerful black women um, share some of their challenges and birth experiences. Right. Yes. So, well, and I, I think, right, that's, I think the narrative for so long was this deficit model, right? And, and, and only thinking of Black people as a whole, people of color as a whole, as um, it's still, right, in this, this thought process, the not always conscious, but inherently just having and permeating struggle. And so I, what began to happen was we were saying, well, that's not the case. We have, there are, <laughs> you know, Black people that have master's degrees and doctorate degrees and um, are fluent, right? And have money and are uh, athletes, right? And entertainers and, um, and, and all of that. And so uh, the conversation was forced to begin to move away from, well, this is about race to racism, because what we were seeing is, um, being able to account for, wait a minute, we have, you know, black folks that are pregnant um, that have access to all of these things and the disparity is still the same. The disparity is still the same. So this cannot be, right? Like when we talk about um, uh, other factors, you know, uh, you know, dental health, right? And, um, you know, living longer and people living longer in certain areas compared to other areas. But this is, um, we have been able to rule out for, right? If you had two, um, you know, black women, one that had a very high income, had higher degree, had access to a lot more resources, one that maybe just had a high school diploma, didn't have, their rates of complications and dying and birth are the same are the same. And, and I think we got there because there was a slow move out of, well, wait a minute. Actually, right, there are. <laughs> black, black, all Black people are not living in poverty. And I think for a while, I think still, culturally, that is not, when we think of, right, Black and Brown people, that is, if we're being honest, not the image that we are told from the time we are very little kids. That is not the image that comes into our mind. And so I think it has taken a while to see well wait a minute no this is there are black people that have all these access and the same access that some white people have and these disparities still persist right i i know in a lot of the research when they started controlling for things like race and education yes and black mothers still fared worse you you have and i think there's a, yeah. a, a data point that um a high school educated 
white woman has a better chance of having a positive birth outcome than a college educated black yes. woman. Yes. And I've seen that. Like Tanika, I have seen that in the last eight years. I have been in rooms (laughs) with white pregnant folks and black pregnant folks. And the difference is palpable. The difference is happening right now. How the patients are listened to, there was things like even who is allowed and not allowed in the room. I'm going to tell you right off the bat right now. In our hospitals, several of our hospitals in Connecticut, if they see or once Medicaid or Husky is seen in the patient's chart, it is a very different level of care. There is, oh, well, you can come in and see this and monitor this, where if there is a patient, right, that is not Medicaid and that is at least maybe light or white presenting, right, even if not white, that is, you do not have eight people walking into the room with a woman that's in labor, never. Never. And um, I would love to Hmm. collect more statistics on this, right? Um, But every single other doula and uh, lactation consultant, anybody else that has interface in a hospital setting with women will tell you that. Um, That the rate of being listened to, just like uh, the amount of people even that are in a room like that, birth is like the most vulnerable (laughs) space that a person is going to be in in their life. Right. And so anybody that comes into that room should be absolutely um, asked, right? That's to the partner, to, to the birthing person. And mm. that is often um, not the case. Mm. The uh, tone and the uh, coercion of things happens much, much more with low income women than it does yeah. with people that have private insurance. I mean, just that, just if you were to keep it at that, right? And then we just know that disproportionately right, lower income women, because of all this history, are more likely to be people of color. But it is absolutely palpable in all those ways um, and more today. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. That's that's hard to take in, but, mm, but I, I, I believe sure. you. I, I mean, I've, I've um, I think in my experience in hospitals as um, a home visiting social worker with, with teen birthing moms, um, our midwives were really, really protective of the mothers. So I, I, I don't think we, and, and I, wasn't, I wasn't there when they were birthing, I would come after the birth, but I think there were intentional efforts. And I, I know in a couple of cases where, so, and I'm not gonna name the hospitals, but there was one hospital where the midwives had privilege, practicing privileges and so really had control over how the birth was gonna go. And if there was any kind of miscommunication or emergency and the moms went to the other hospital where the midwives did not have those per, uh, privileges, it, it, you know, it, it was just bad every time. It was just, there was something that happened that was just, you know, egregious or, or really upsetting or traumatic for the mother. So I, yeah, I, I don't have a hard time believing what you're saying. Okay. Um, it's, it's like, and it hurts and I, I don't want to right? like, it's like, I so don't want it to be the case that even in my own mind, sometimes I'm like, no, this must be, you know, something else. Right. Um, yeah. But it's not. And to the point where a lot of uh, people with more privilege or um, white, right, uh, birth workers that I've seen, the point where like, they'll notice it and see it before the, right, like their client yeah. will see it, even right. if they're a person of yeah. color. Uh, because... Um, again, I think despite common thought that like, we're all, you know, that people of color are always like thinking that <laughs> things are racist. Actually, it's not true. Uh, right. And, and tend to sometimes even go to like, no, I must have, right. Like done X, Y, Z. And so, um, it, it's, it's, it's a heavy, heavy thing to, to, to think about. And I think in terms of moving, f- like, what do we do? Um, again, those, those agencies and finding ways to support them, but also reaching out to finding who are the local, um, lactation consultants of color. We need to be supporting. We need more lactation, lactation consultants. We need more childbirth educators. It's like barely any in Connecticut. Um, doulas, we have a decent, I mean, we obviously could use more, but we've, we've done better with like, you know, doulas of color. Um, 
and midwives, right? So midwifery care, doula care, and again, comprehensive childbirth education given to the families. And, and um, again, even like sharing that information with um, providers is really, those are like kind of the, the key tickets to bettering this current uh, situation for, for Black women giving birth. So I see where we are at the time, and I, I know we want to have Q&A, but I just wanted to show one more quick visual yeah. of what has, I think this, was this released by um, Black Mamas Matter Association, the Black Birthing Right, the Bill of Black Birthing Rights? Yes, um, National Association to Advance Black Birth. Yes, like okay. I have it right there on my okay. wall. It's like, Thanks. let me look. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sharing it. it. I hope people can see it. Um, I think in, in terms of if we want to talk about advocacy or just empowerment of, of our patients or clients or people we work with, this, this is a great start, I think. And I, I know you share this in your evidence-based childbirth education class, and it's just so powerful. It, it's, it's so basic, but it's yeah. so powerful. Um, right. And this is something that I think is being distributed to patients, but also to providers, to, to be seen and heard, to have your humanity recognized, to be respected, to be believed when you say that um, you're having pain or something doesn't feel right, um, to inform people of their pain relief options. We know that providers are typically reticent to prescribe to Black patients because there's this assumption that um, Black patients will abuse narcotics. <laughs> And, and abuse pain medication. Yes, um, yes. Recognizing the right to decide, deciding how to feed and not making assumptions. I, I work with um, a, a couple of providers who in a, in a wonderful um, de a department of, New Haven Department of Public Health, Maternal Child Health Unit, who talks yes. about, um, she's also a lactation consultant. When she works with her mothers, how the lactation consultants will often overlook black mothers and assume that they don't wanna breastfeed just because of the statistical you know, disparity oh. but that that isn't necessarily a lack of interest. There's other reasons for that, right? Um, There's so much there with breastfeeding and why the breastfeeding rates are low, right? For 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 Black women, and again, thinking about going back to the history that Black women were wet nurses for white children and could not feed or be around their own children. Right. You I, know, also what we found in, in my clinical work with teenagers who often are, are, have lower breastfeeding rates is people don't often think about many teenage mothers are also victims and survivors of childhood sexual abuse. And so that enters the breastfeeding relationship and can make things very complicated. Yes. So sometimes it is not in the mother's best interest to breastfeed under those circumstances. So there's, right, there's a lot to unpack. Um, yes, I, that's an excellent point, Tanika. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's, I mean, that's a whole, I. Agree. And having done, and I love, and that's like a group I am so, um, so passionate about. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, it's very different too, right? When you have someone that they can't relate to either by age or right, ethnicity kind of coming in and telling them they need to do this thing. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, again, where like, we need more representation amongst um, our, our, birth workers, right? Lactation consultants, childbirth educators, doulas, midwives. We need more black, we need more black midwives for sure. Yes, all of that. Well, this, I know we could go on and on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I could. But um, I, I see that we already have a question in the Q&A and I want to turn it over to Dr. Shannon King um, to facilitate some of the question and answer uh, part of this, so. Thank you, Autumn and Tanika for such a generative and important conversation. Um, so we have a question from Nicole Paradise. How are we supporting mid midwives and birth doulas who are working in systems that cause this level of harm slash disparities for black and Latinx birthing people? Mm. I imagine the stress level, et cetera, would be so high. Yes, yes. And the answer is right now, we're not doing enough and the birth workers we have are fabulous that are of color, but absolutely at risk of, of burnout and even trauma. So we, we didn't, there's so much to talk about here, but our rates of birth trauma um, are one in three. And that is the same for labor and delivery nurses. Right now, one in three labor and delivery nurses have experienced a birth that was so traumatic that they meet criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. One in three. Labor and delivery nurses, I gotta say that again, right now, 
meet the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder based on the traumatic birth that they were present for. So enter our doulas, right? Even sometimes our lactation consultants are there like right after, and there might still be traumatic experiences occurring. Um, that absolutely, that our doulas and midwives, right? And lactation consultants certainly puts them at risk. And so the, the best ways, one, to support them is by uh, we, what we need more of them. So looking at who are, who are the, the local midwives of color, right? Taking some time, uh, midwives of color, who are the local doulas of color and asking them too, what do they need? Because they'll tell you. <laughs> You know, sometimes, you know, it might be, um, you know, advocating for a certain thing in a certain way. Um, it might be um, trying to support their work, right? A lot of most doulas, especially most doulas of color, um, are trying to support other folks that might not have access or access to pay for a doula. So a lot of them will have like um, uh, donations, right? Or have like a community doula kind of program where you can donate so that they, or they can partner with other doulas to support, right? More women so that they also aren't burned out from having to go, 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 go. And certainly, you know, witness some, some difficulties in that setting in a hospital setting in particular. Um, but I would identify, you know, um, there's a tremendous, um, Connecticut birth uh, professionals page. So that's a great way. But even if you just type in like doulas, doulas of color um, in Connecticut, you know, the midwives um, and like, honestly, reach out to them and ask them specifically what they need because they're all like, you know, might be doing different work in different places. But one is we need more so that there's not a few carrying all that weight. I mean, that's number one, we need more. Um, and two is asking them what are specific aspects that they're working on um, uh, within their role as a doula that 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 could be supported. Sometimes that's financial. Sometimes that might be, um, you know, helping them get a, a word out about certain information or a class they're running. Um, but those are those are definitely some of the best ways uh, for now. Thank you. So I I also had a, a question. Yeah. Um, I wondered what are the ways that some of the some of a lot of the information that you're sharing can be um, shared in a more community oriented way. So, um, are folks actually visiting black churches or beauty shops or those kinds of spaces where they could potentially speak to? Um, not only Black women, but several generations of Black women. Is that kind of work being done? That's awesome. And yes, it is by uh, a lot of Black birth workers. And there's a lot, um, you know, uh, Dr. King, that are that are working to try to create like community centers and get funding to, to do that sort of, right, to really be able to like um, permeate, which again, like, it takes time, but yes, a lot of uh, doulas of color are working and connecting with, um, I'm in the New Haven area, right? So I'm thinking about um, local community mental health centers and clinics, working with Iris, that's in New Haven. Um, I mean, really, really like getting out and just going to anywhere there are people and likely right, pregnant people or someone that knows um, a, a pregnant person, I would say, um, again, that's a reason to really reach out to um, uh, to doulas. There's going to be um, a whole list serve, and maybe we can add that to this um, for people to reach out because that might be a great way to help uh, doulas that are trying to to do that work and like form uh, coalitions. Um, there's work. Um, there are some doulas that are working to try to like push for more. Um, birth centers in their community, right? Or that are just trying to create community centers where it's like, you're pregnant, you can come in and get a massage, get perinatal therapy, um, all, all of those things. And that is predominantly done, which is great by the women of color, but there certainly could be a lot of support in both getting the word out and just knowing people, right? When we're talking about like privilege, it's not always necessarily money, but just the spaces you're in, right? And like, statistically speaking, right, folks, um, uh, that might have more privilege, right? 
um, are going to tend to maybe know people that might have access to a building or a space, right? So it's not always money or know somebody that, um, you know, has a connection that can donate time for, you know, for, so those kinds of things are really important. So that's why I say really reaching, just reach out. How can I help you? Um, Black women have very seldom been, and specifically that are doing this work, been in a position where people are asking them, what can I do for you? You're doing this really important healing work. So that's the that's the biggest thing I want to say. I want to say there. Okay, we have two more two uh, more questions, and they will be the final questions. And so I'll ask them sure. together. And the questions um, uh, invite both Tanika and Autumn. So mm -hmm. Jenna, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, La Judas. Autumn and Tanika, this presentation and your work are important and necessary. I know that there are midwifery students here in this webinar. Based on all of your research and experiences in, in maternal slash child health, could you each share one suggestion of something they could do slash implement tomorrow or next week when they are in the clinical setting to best support Black patients? and families, thank you. And then Doug Edwards asks, can you talk about the role of dads during the birthing process? Can their involvement mediate inequities? Oh, excellent, uh, excellent. Uh, so yes, so Jenna, I wanna jump in. What, what doesn't happen now and um, in general with women, but particularly with women of color is they're not given, they're not listened to, right? And they're not actually given information on whatever's being presented to them. So the first things I tell um, uh, midwifery students specifically too that I work with or, or nursing students is talk through the benefits and risks with the patients. So your students, if they go in like tomorrow or next week, um, the acronym I like to use, and maybe you're familiar with it, is BRAIN, right? Like talk, to have them take the time to do the B-R-A-I-N. So B is discussing the benefits of whatever it is. Maybe it's like uh, exercise, right? Or maybe it's an earlier visit and you're talking about nutrition, but have them talk about with the patients, the benefits, the risks, alternatives, ha give them space for the eyes is intuition. So like having them acknowledge and give, hey, do you want some time to talk about this? Or we can come back in, I don't know, a few minutes. Um, and also going through if, if the patient decides not to move forward, um, you know, N is nothing. So B-R-A-I-N, benefits, risks, alternatives, intuition, and nothing. And just holding space and making sure that they're really going through that with patients is giving them their right to informed consent, right? And that is their legal right. And unfortunately, that process often isn't gone through with, with, with birthing patients, but in particular, um, women of color, right? And they often feel forced or talked to in a way, right? That they are coerced to do a thing that that provider thinks is best without checking in with them. And we know that there are three pillars to evidence-based care. It is having the current research evidence. It is having a provider that knows how to articulate and read that evidence. And that third pillar is the values of, right? The values and desires of that birthing patient. So we cannot have evidence-based care without those three. And so having the, your students go through that process, B-R-A-I-N with them is a really, is tremendous. If everyone was doing that, uh, that in itself uh, would just be such in, again, giving patients informed consent, which is their legal right. Um, and, and, and having them be able to really make a decision about what's best for them versus um, this kind of historical, uh, you know, more paternalistic way that, that we tend to do it in our, in our country. Tanika, do you have any thoughts on that one? I think, yeah, I just wanted to really quickly add, one of the things I learned in my clinical work was that as, as families come with different customs and stories and narratives and approaches to pregnancy and also to child rearing and infant care, um, oftentimes the instinct can be very quick to say, well, that's not what the research says. <laughs> but that's, and as much as we're emphasizing evidence-based approaches, which is really important, I think it's also important to sometimes say, well, tell me more about that. Uh, why, you know, why do you think it's important? Um, I had a young mom once tell me that she wasn't going to breastfeed her baby because her grandmother got very angry and had a fight with her husband and then went to breastfeed her son and he died. And that was the family narrative. 
And so instead of immediately saying, but breast is best for the baby and, and these are the reasons why, we had to get behind the, what, 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 you know, how, how did that story come about? And um, well, here's some other information that maybe help you make a more informed decision. But this had gone through three generations of the family and not realizing that your moods don't make your breast milk poisonous. Um, but sometimes you need to get the clarification of the, the family story first. And that's huge, right? And I think that speaks to Tanika, right? This um, being culturally acknowledged, you know, like acknowledging and, and just being sensitive to ask that question. And again, I know in our system right now, it's so rushed. You know, the, the average amount of time for most OB visits is like 12 to 15 minutes. Right. You know, and that is long with midwives. It tends to be about right, 45 minutes or an hour. So our care, everything is so rushed. Um, but we really have to be able to slow it down because what the fact of the matter is women are dying in particular, our black women and babies are dying because we're not slowing down to ask those questions and we're not slowing down to explain things to them and to go through the brain. Mm -hmm. Right. So what about the dads? <laughs> I, I yes. No dads. So dads and partners, um, are huge, 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 um, uh, piece of, of, of care and really uh, the partner's role through pregnancy and even the birthing process is being able to be there to advocate. And I say, um, you know, the biggest thing is that I think people feel like they can't, right? Or like, oh, if our doctor says something like that's it, right? We have to go with it. And so the biggest thing I wanna say is for dads, I think the biggest piece is going to be to really, I would say, get into and really try to take a comprehensive childbirth education class that's gonna like, be able to go in depth on how, 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 and what does your role look like when you're advocating, you know, and, and what can you say? But one, I, I want to say the same thing, listen to your intuition and to your partner. And unless there is like a crisis, which medical providers are great at letting you know, right, if there's, there won't be a problem, but unless there's like really an imminent crisis, you always have time. If you feel pressured in any situation, dads, partners, um, whoever's there, you can say, we want time to think about this. Another thing I tell um, um, and pregnant families I work with even as a doula or in childbirth class um, is what's known as like the Ellis prayer method, you know? So again, if you're feeling like they're not giving you space, if you say, we'd like to take a moment just to pray on it, whether that's something you do or, or you know, or don't do, um, but that really uh, can be an effective tool for clearing the room. Like people aren't going to push you on that unless again, there's really an imminent, you know, situation. So I think that's for partners. One of the biggest things that can be easy to feel like pressured and your role in advocating a lot of the times in those situations is going to be, let's take light, take space. Let me talk with my partner and then decide what it is I need. Um, and again, really take getting into one of those, uh, a comprehensive childbirth class, like an evidence-based birth class is really where you talk really about like specifics of how to communicate and, and the, best, uh, the best ways to handle staff. And um, even talking a little bit about like understanding staff lingo and what, what they're kind of going through and how to, how to kind of get through um, in that way um, will be really, really important. So I wanted to thank Tanika and Autumn and thank you all for coming. Have a good evening and have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.